uh, Teacher Task Force is a global alliance uh, uh, of or international organizations of member states in promoting uh, teacher and the teacher related policies and practices. Uh, we are supporting the, the achievement of SDG uh, four point C, which is the supply of qualified teachers. And um, uh, I, I think um, we are very lucky uh, to have uh, seven um, uh, speakers. Uh, we would start with a presentation from the Secretariat of Teacher Task Force about uh, TTF's response to the COVID-19 pandemic, focusing on its call for action on teachers, uh, which will be presented by Head AI Teacher Task Force Secretariat and also Director, Division for Policies and the Lifelong Learning Systems of UNESCO, Mr. Boreen Chakran. Uh, this will also be followed by a series of presentations by the TT TTF member countries, uh, including China, uh, um, including um, Cambodia, um, uh, India, uh, and also uh, Maldives uh, on their uh, experiences of responding uh, to the challenges of, of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and uh, uh, so, uh, and there will be a question and answer time, Q&A time uh, after the presentations of, of the countries. And uh, we will also have a very brief uh, wrap up sessions uh, to, to wrap up what we, we've discussed. Uh, so uh, uh, for this meeting, we are so lucky to have seven speakers, uh, distinguished speakers. The first is uh, my colleague, um, Bor Mr. Borin Chakran. As I already introduced, he is the uh, acting head of uh, Teacher Task Force Secretariat uh, and also a director of division. Uh, for policies and the life learning system uh, based in UNESCO headquarters in Paris. We also have uh, uh, Mr. Sandes uh, D uh, from Cambo uh, Cambodia's representative uh, to the International Teacher Task Force and also Deputy um, Director General for Education from Ministry of, Edu of Education, Youth and Sports uh, from Cambodia. We are also very happy to have the presence of Mr. Ren Yuqing, uh, Director General of the Department uh, of Teacher Education from Ministry of Education of the People's Republic of China. Uh, we are also having uh, Professor uh, Padma Saran Pani, uh, Chairperson of the Center for Education, Innovation and Action Research uh, uh, from Tata Institute uh, of Education. Uh, based in Mumbai, uh, India. And uh, we are very pleased to have the presence of uh, Dr. Abdullah Lashi, uh, Honorable Minister of uh, State for Education um, and the head of uh, National Institute of Education from Maldive. And uh, we are also having uh, Dr. Tara uh, Petir, uh, senior economist uh, from the World Bank, uh, head of teacher thematic group from the World Bank to join us today. Uh, and the uh, last but not the least, Dr. Esso Agnes uh, Valenzuela, uh, director of uh, senior secretariat. So without further ado, I would like to give the floor to my colleague, uh, Boreen, uh, for his presentation about teacher task forces uh, response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Boreen, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Li Bing. Good afternoon to you. Good afternoon to uh, the, the panelists and to all the participants. I would like also to convey my warm greetings to the uh, TTF uh, members. Uh, you mentioned World Bank, VVOB, and other partners who uh, are joining us today. Uh, I will take you through a very short presentation um, regarding the work we are doing as a teacher task force and uh, the engagement that we have been uh, doing since the, the COVID outbreak. So uh, first of all, maybe I can recall uh, who are the members of the uh, global coalition and who is engaged in, in, the, uh, in the teacher task force. Uh, next, maybe. Uh, so basically, uh, we have uh, a large number of uh, organizations that are now engaged in the teacher task force. We have around 100, 140 organizations and countries. Uh, it's a network that uh, is uh, geographically 
covering uh, all member states and all uh, the regions in the world. This is um, uh, an important network that uh, is engaged on three results. Next, please. We are uh, focusing on, uh, first of all, advocacy with an important uh, effort on uh, policy dialogue forums. And we had the last one in Dubai focusing on the teaching uh, workforce and the future of the teaching workforce. We have uh, a second uh, result, uh, which is focusing on knowledge creation and sharing. And uh, I'm happy to announce that we launched the Teacher Task Force Knowledge Platform uh, two weeks ago, and, and it's now up and running and uh, many colleagues can access resources that are covering different themes and areas related to um, teacher uh, dimensions. And the last is uh, regarding country support and engagement. And there we have uh, developed a teacher policy development guide, which is used uh, by many member states and also by different partners who are engaged in uh, teachers policy reviews and, and teacher development. Maybe specifically related to um, the, uh, the knowledge platform, uh, just for you to, to see that uh, this is a platform that is now uh, uh, up and, and live. You mm -hmm. may access it on uh, the Tisha Task Force uh, website. Uh, there will be a really uh, updated information resources collected from all over the world, and we hope that this will, will serve both policymakers but also practitioners and researchers active in the field of, of, of teachers. And uh, the policy guide that we have developed is already there and we are working on additional tools that will support the policy reviews and policy development in the area of teachers. On the response to the COVID, first of all, let me say that uh, the Teacher Task Force has been uh, very agile in responding to the, to the crisis. We worked with the, first we update, updated and adjusted some of our work uh, plans uh, depending on the, the situation. We also uh, published a call for action on teachers, which uh, aims uh, to uh, preserve and support teachers in the context of the emergency. One uh, area is about preserving employment and wages. The second uh, area of the call for action is about prioritizing teachers and learners' health, safety, and well being. The third is about uh, including teachers in the development of uh, the COVID-19 education responses and, and uh, consulting them and engaging them in decision making. The next uh, part of the uh, call for action covered three other uh, areas that are important from our point of view. One is about adequate professional support and training, capacitating teachers to cope with the, with the challenges of remote learning and engaging in, uh, effectively in that. Also, uh, putting equity at the heart of education responses, because uh, we know that uh, vulnerability uh, is impacting uh, many learners and also teachers, for example, teachers in rural areas and, and uh, in remote uh, areas. And, and the last one is about uh, including teachers in the aid responses. We know that uh, there is a lot of attention from the international community to support member states, but we want that teachers are uh, at the core of these, the support because they will determine the quality and the equity of the learning process that will happen. So these are the six areas of uh, call for action. We also looked at the importance, and I think uh, we all uh, understood from the crisis there is a, a challenge and there is a digital gap that uh, is, is obvious uh, in the context of the COVID, that we know there are the who have access and connected and who have not, and that the digital divide uh, is impacting both the equity and inclusion of the remote learning, but also is affecting uh, the teachers and their capacity to deliver. So we have been doing a lot of analysis and drawing attention of uh, decision makers, of uh, the members of the coalition and, and the partners uh, about the importance of giving attention to the digital divide and the connectivity aspect. And uh, what is important is that as we move forward into uh, the reopening and uh, recovery phase, that we support teachers in the back to school efforts. It's important. First of all, we issued a guidance for policymakers. It, uh, it is aligned also with the uh, framework that we have adopted with the uh, UNESCO, uh, UNICEF, uh, World Bank, and WFP on reopening schools. But the lens that the Teacher Task Force, together with the ILO, UNESCO, and other partners, uh, put is about uh, the teachers' dimension and, and the guidance for policymakers 
to uh, in include the teacher they mentioned in the um, efforts to uh, return to school. This was more for policymakers, but we are also working on uh, a guidance tool for uh, practitioner, uh, school leaders, and, and uh, teachers in the, in the schools. It goes to, I would say, the meso and, and the micro level. And uh, there are different dimensions there. Maybe the next slide. So we have looked at uh, those dimensions, and I hope that in the discussion today, we'll hear from you if, uh, are we missing uh, area, or where do you see the priority of action? One, uh, we are focusing on safety and health. It remains a top priority on teachers' psychological and social emotional well-being. We are also focusing on teacher prepare, uh, preparation and, and learning to cope with the, uh, with the return to school in, in a new condition, new no normality. Uh, it's about uh, teacher deployment and rice and working conditions, of course. The financial resources and investment, we know that we are in an economic recession and we expect that the public expenditure will shrink. And that means mechanically that the public expenditure on education may, there is a risk that they shrink. And we see a, a, a potential risk on uh, resources that are located to teachers and, and teachers' wages teachers' capacity development. So we would like to preserve uh, the, uh, the rights and, and resources allocated to education and specifically to teachers in this case. And of course, monitoring and evaluation, and last but not least, which uh, for us is a cornerstone of any policy uh, engagement and planning, is the social dialogue and communication to all stakeholders. So these are the different areas that the, uh, the guidance tool that we are developing uh, and we are submitting to all uh, member states, practitioners, school leaders uh, will be covering. And I hope that uh, during the discussion today, you refer to that and maybe you'll, you'll uh, advise us on how we can move forward in terms of supporting you and, and engaging in, in this dimension. Maybe the last point that I wanted to highlight is that uh, this regional meeting is uh, of uh, uh, highest importance for us. First of all, uh, this is a, a first of a regional meeting that we will be organizing in different regions. Uh, you are the pioneers. Uh, we will also have a sub-Saharan African um, uh, regional meeting. We'll have Arab states uh, meeting and, and we'll move to the other regions. We would like to focus on some thematic priorities and I hope uh, my colleagues and during the discussion, you will help us decide on uh, what are those thematic priorities. And obviously uh, the regional uh, dimension is about fostering knowledge and sharing uh, policy, sharing um, experiences and, and engaging in the policy dialogue. So I hope that through this regional engagement, we will achieve these uh, different aspects. And uh, I look forward for uh, our discussion today. Thank you very much. And, and please visit our website. Uh, there are much resources that uh, you will find there. Thank you, Libing, for uh, giving me this opportunity to engage. Back to you. Thank you very much, uh, Boreen, for your very comprehensive uh, overview of the, what uh, the, the T International Teacher Task Force has been doing so far uh, since the uh, fund, uh, establishment in 2008. Actually, uh, it's very important that the platform itself is very inclusive. It's uh, covering, uh, you know, it's engaging all the stakeholders. As you know, the approach is very much inclusive. We are engaging uh, policymakers, researchers, and also practitioners at the school level. We are engaging school leaders. And also it's important that we have been, we've been focusing not only on physical you know, well-being, but also the psychological and uh, also social emotional well-being of the teachers, especially during this uh, COVID-19 pandemic uh, period. And uh, uh, we are also very happy to see that equity and inclusion is, is at the heart of the teacher policies and the practices. This is very much in, in line with uh, UNESCO's uh, values uh, and the principles. Okay, thank you very much, Pauline, once again, for, for your comprehensive uh, 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 overview of the teacher task force. Um, let's now move to our next session, which is presentations uh, from, uh, from the member states. And uh, I would like to remind each speaker that uh, you, are only have, you will only have five minutes, which is very difficult, I, I know that, but try to stick to the time of five minutes. Uh, and uh, I will be reminding you if uh, it's, uh, there's still uh, 30 minutes left, uh, and uh, I will remind you. Uh, first, I, I would like to uh, give the floor uh, to, uh, Mr. Sanders, D. 
Di uh, from Cambodia. Um, as I introduced him uh, earlier, he is the Cambodia's representative to the International Teacher Task Force and the Deputy Director General for Education uh, from the Ministry of Education, Youth and Sport from Cambodia. Now the floor is yours, uh, Dr. Sandesh. for organizing uh, this kind of forum. I think we, now we are closely connected and we learn from each other in dealing with the issues. In uh, my presentation, I focus on only uh, about four slides. One is to ensure that the learning take place. And uh, next is uh, to ensure that the student learn with support uh, from different uh, stakeholders, including teachers and school. And uh, third, uh, to ensure teachers are well supported to deliver to students and how to support teachers after the reopening of the school. Next slide, please. Um, point number one, this uh, Cambodia uh, decided to close down uh, the school in mid-March. And, and then teaching and learning online uh, has been introduced, including uh, the TV education program, uh, Facebook, and, uh, and greatly introduced. Uh, we have uh, development partners here, UNESCO, UNICEF, and various projects, the World Bank, NGOs, including private sectors, IT, private sectors support the government as it's called for alternative learning approach to ensure that uh, everything is running properly if despite the, the threat of the COVID and, and the causing the close down of the school. So we have to ensure that uh, and, uh, the learning opportunities is inclusive, including ethnic minority and children with disabilities. I will uh, let you know that um, we have the uh, TV program uh, in order to ensure that uh, those without access to smartphone and computers would have access to TV program. We have education officers going to school, going to uh, houses of the student and learners to ensure they have the menu of the program and so that they can have access to radio program for ethnic minorities. And the TV program is using the sign language as well to ensure that uh, 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 they learn inclusively. And also to ensure all the teacher training institution, uh, uh, teacher education providers uh, keep uh, going in, in, in training all the teacher trainees to ensure, to ensure all that. Telegram, uh, very popular in here, and almost 99% of teachers use Telegram smartphone. Facebook, uh, teacher and student, uh, especially high school uh, student, they have uh, Facebook. So the majority and the ministry's Facebook uh, uh, with uh, 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 the registered, I mean the ministry Facebook has over uh, three million uh, uh, fans uh, follows the ministry of Facebook. So uh, because of that, and, and the ministry become more active, and we have the Department of IT in the ministry has been very instrumental to ensure uh, uh, education and training, including operation of the ministry, uh, is ongoing very well. Next slide, please. Um, uh, this, this is, um, I, I, we, we discuss about the inclusiveness of, of students in uh, remote areas and all, as well as teachers. There are still uh, some schools, some uh, areas without internet connection. The smartphone is very difficult, but uh, the TV can be made possible. And also the local authority, they have, uh, they copy materials and, and they ask the parent to come and collect uh, material uh, from the school. And if they need support, teachers can uh, visit uh, the, their family to ensure home learning. 
and also have uh, the, the, the provincial education office and district education office um, uh, issue guideline on how to, to, uh, to teach uh, students at home and with support or something. So it has been issued. Uh, we know that even, even we try, but uh, students still want to, to, uh, to be face to face with the teachers, but uh, this is what we, we have to ensure. Next slide, please. Sorry, and, sorry, you have uh, one more minute. Thank you. Okay, uh, we have to ensure the teachers are well supported to deliver education to students. The, the central and provincial education authority organize uh, training to teachers how to use Telegram, how to use a communication platform, and various means to ensure that each teacher has group their student and for the student who who could not afford to have a telegram, it has to be supported by teachers and school administrators to reach them. And we invite outstanding teachers to come to the ministry or to come to provincial uh, town to record the video and then that can be shared among teachers via telegram or on TV, on Facebook and on the radio. Last, next slide please. Yes, um, and to ensure that the teacher and students uh, when the school is opening and uh, I, I think the, uh, the, the, the ministry has drafted the guideline right now is pending for approval and the hygiene measures per instructed by Ministry of Health and has been uh, considered uh, strictly to apply and uh, the ministry issues various, various guidelines and instructions uh, to ensure safety when we start operating uh, and uh, at school and we have done a lot of recording of the video by subject to be shared at school to ensure that uh, the student should not be packed in one classroom so we look into half and half make sure that the number of, of, the, of students in the class not so crowded so we have uh, adjusted the school-based teaching time and uh, teachers teaching time and to ensure that uh, safety will be uh, uh, made uh, to be ensure, and it is likely that uh, we look into reopening in November at the latest. So, if the situation getting better, I stop here, and then we can interact further for question and answer later on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you uh, for the very, uh, very um, comprehensive, uh, informative presentation about the case in Cambodia. Uh, it's very exciting to hear the concept of uh, effective teaching and learning because whatever the means, uh, effective teaching and learning is the ultimate uh, uh, objectives of any teaching and learning activities. So effective learning is, is really uh, very, very uh, important. And I also saw the uh, idea of uh, inclusive uh, learning arrangements for ethnic uh, minority groups and also the, uh, the use of uh, low-tech and also no-tech uh, solutions rather than only always uh, uh, internet-based solutions. Uh, and I'm happy that the ministry is preparing a lot of guidelines uh, to, to be used at the school level, uh, which is really important. And um, I know that uh, teacher training is very important. The teachers need to be well prepared for the uh, new normal uh, of teaching and learning at schools, and uh, uh, they need to be uh, well prepared. And in Cambodia, I saw a very good example of uh, conducting trainers training training of master teachers uh, to be you know you, uh, to to be used you know in the in the remote areas. So uh, this is all very commendable uh, and uh, uh, which is really uh, uh, impressive. Uh, now let's move to our second uh, speaker, which is uh, Professor Leng Youqing uh, from China. Uh, he is. Uh, Director General of the Department for Teacher Education from the Ministry of Education of the People's Republic of China. Uh, the floor is yours, uh, Professor Ren. Oh, Li Bing, so nice to meet you. I'm very nice happy. to see you. Uh, mm. <laughs> so, dear colleagues, good afternoon and good morning. I'm Ren Yuqin from the Department of Teacher Affairs of uh, China's uh, Ministry of Education. Uh, actually, there are basic data here. They are more than uh, 510,000 schools, including the kindergartens, and uh, 278 million students, including the children in kindergartens, and more than 17 million teachers in China. So it is uh, a quite big data. 
According to the theme of the meeting, I will briefly introduce the development of work on teachers and the teaching in China during the response to the COVID-19 epidemic. Uh, next slide. Uh, the first is the some basic uh, situation. During the epidemic, works on teachers and teaching in China mainly encompass the five phases. The first phase, preparation during the winter vacation. Uh, when the epidemic broke out in China on January 20th, the schools are so lucky in winter vacation at the uh, beginning of the semester was approaching and the epidemic was not under control, the Chinese government decided to postpone the returns to schools. All regions in China began to establish large-scale system to carry out online education and teaching. The second phrase started the semester online. From February the 2nd to March the 2nd, because we have 31, 32 provinces, uh, so they opened in different date. Uh, online education started in 31 provinces in China. During this period, the Ministry of Education has introduced the policy measures for guiding the online education in all regions in China regarding online teaching, electronic course materials, psychological counseling, funding guarantee, information support, examination enrollment, funding for students, um, medical staffs, child care, and the, the campus prevention and control at central. The third phase, the normalization of online education. This phase started on March the 2nd and lasted until April 17th, when in most provinces, students in core grades return to schools at this stage, the Ministry of Education summarized and uh, deployed tasks for filling up the insufficient of education caused by non-face-to-face -face communication between teachers and students to ensure that no one left behind. At the same time, countermeasures were put forward for possible programs caused by post postponing examinations and uh, graduate uh, employment. Uh, next slide. The fourth phase, students in core grades return to the schools. From March 9th to May 25th, the students in the third grade of middle schools and high schools in all provinces across the country have basically returned to schools because they will prepare their examination for, for promote. During this period, the Ministry of Education issued a guideline for the prevention and the control of COVID-19 epidemic, prevention and the control technology plan, uh, disposal plans for universities, uh, primary and secondary schools and kindergartens, and opened online reporting channels to avoid a clustering risk on campus. The fifth phase, four returns to school. Since April 13, the students in Jiangsu province have returned to school. Uh, and uh, as, as of May 24th, uh, 24th, 146 million students of primary and secondary schools and children have returned to schools and kindergartens. We also have over 5 million university students have started their new semester at universities. During this period, the Ministry of Education organized two on-site press conferences to introduce the situation, respond to social concerns on hot issues, and study countermeasures for possible post-epidemic syndrome programs. So this is the first part of what I want to mention. Second part, uh, the next slide, the main experience accumulated. The first is to make sure that teachers have uh, instructions of online education. Facing the challenge of the more than 17 million teachers online teaching, we have released a series of strategies for online teaching, homeschool cooperation, psychological Sorry, concept. one more minute, one more minute. Ma I know, I know, it's central. Selected and introduced more than 270 local work case sets in three phases, released more than 
10,000 hours of teacher training resources, packaged of 24 units, and organized the online symposium of experts. I also hosted a lot of uh, symposium. The second is to ensure the rest rights of education of all students. The achievements of basic education informatization in China over the years are an important foundation for supporting this large scale online education. During the epidemic, the Ministry of Education, together with the Ministry of Industry and Information Technology and the National Radio and Television Administration coordinated to make the best use of national platform and the local resources television and internet courses to achieve comprehensive coverage to ensure the learning needs of students in rural areas and reduce the impact on teachers' eyes. The third is to guide the local governments to release measures which adapt to local conditions. The geographical differences in China are relatively large. Thus, after the Ministry of Education clarified the conditions and the principle about returning to schools, the following order and the following order to complement the resumption of work and the production first, secondary to reopen the primary and the middle schools, third to reopen the universities and finally the kindergartens. Each province is called to design the dates of school reopening on their own. This method is also good experience in the prevention and the control of epidemics in China. Considering time, this is what I want to mention. Please feel free to let us know if you want to, me to give you more information. Thank you, Li Bing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ren, for, for your very inspiring presentation. I know that in China, the system is huge, right? Compared in terms of number of schools and the number of students. So it's not that easy to manage the whole system. And I, I'm glad to see that the, you have a decentralized arrangements yes. uh, for the ministry to develop mainly the guideline. And then it's up to the province, provincial department of education to decide even you know, local education authority to decide. So this is quite uh, interesting. And also uh, we have seen a strong, uh, uh, you know, a very strong network of platforms uh, in, in place in China, uh, which a uh, teacher can use, uh, or, uh, including capacity building of the, of the teachers on uh, online teaching. But also uh, you are collecting cases of online teaching, which is very useful actually. It yes. can be used for the training of teachers. So mm -hmm. uh, teaching by case uh, studies is, is very useful. And uh, of course, I would also notice this uh, in China, you have so many open educational resources platform teacher can use, right? So this is also quite uh, very, very you know, impressive. Uh, thank you very much again for, for, for your contribution. Okay. Uh, now mm -hmm. I would like to move uh, to uh, our third speaker, uh, Professor uh, Padma uh, Saran Pani from, from India. Uh, she is a, a, a chairperson uh, of Center for, Edu uh, for Education, Innovation and Action Research uh, from uh, Tata Institute of Social Science, Mumbai. I'm really interested in action research because it's, it's one of the very basic you know, approach used uh, by teacher uh, in their uh, continuing and the professional development uh, you know, programs. So the floor is yours, Professor. Thank you. Thank you very much for this opportunity. It's great to be back uh, as a part of this important uh, international forum, which focuses on the key lever of de delivering the promise of education, the teacher. And at our center, we are definitely committed to bring, uh, restoring uh, the standards and a perspective on the need for excellence in teachers' work and teacher education and as well as using action research to build on teacher agency and autonomy, enabling them to make informed decisions in the classroom. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, could I have the next slide, please? So I'm speaking about India, but also reflecting on the South Asian context. I've had opportunities recently to look at this whole region and understand educational challenges, responses, and especially uh, teachers and their work in the region. So I'd like to speak a little bit to the region's issues and concerns as well. I think what's important about the region is that we account, um, we have a disproportionately large number of youth in the region. It's an important demographic um, statistic, which could be a dividend if we get things right in education. But right now with the COVID crisis, having 
spread over the region and given our own historical inequalities, um, there is a serious challenge that we now face in ensuring that we deliver um, the promise of education to the region's youth. Um, we have among the world's largest teaching core, and there are of course huge variations in the region between India and Bhutan and Maldives, and we're going to hear about Maldives a little later. The region already has some challenges which we've been struggling to overcome over the uh, last couple of decades when the focus has shifted to quality, which is teacher shortages, vacancies, and the uneven professional development and qualification throughout the region. Uh, but important reforms have been initiated in every country in the region to get out of this vote learning oriented traditional educational systems to more active learning. And my one of our concerns is that the COVID crisis and the introduction of technology shouldn't lead to a situation when we regress to more traditional rote content oriented forms of education instead of focusing on skill development and the 21st century skills. Could I have the next slide, please? Some of the concerns that the region already has as far as teaching is concerned is the growing casualization of the teaching workforce, the lack of adequate infrastructure in the schools, and a growth of a testing culture, which tends to kind of focus on discourses of incompetence, deficiency, accountability, instead of building on strong professional identity, which teachers of the region have. In fact, um, teachers, when you talk to them about what is important in the profession, focus on the teacher-pupil relationship, as being central and greatly value professional autonomy. In India, we began the process of introducing ICT into schools way back in the 80s, and we are in the fourth phase of the ICT at school program. But so until uh, recently, this was in a boot model in which out, uh, non, uh, people from outside the core teaching uh, CADA were responsible for running labs and the focus was on digital literacy rather than integrating ICT into the classroom. And that's something that the region has to now deal with and overcome. Since 2015, there's been a lot of experimentation in using technology to address quality issues of the region. There's a tendency to use a data-driven model and focusing on micro control of teachers' work and centralizing decision-making, which unfortunately technology very easily supports. And the important challenge for the region is how to use technology to strengthen professional development of teachers, how to build communities of practice to strengthen capacity building of teachers, and to use technology as a constructive tool in the hands of learners to strengthen active learning and deep learning with the involvement of teachers. And some of the work that we've been do doing at TISS has been in this direction of how we devolve control over technology to teachers rather than using technology as a way of diminishing the teacher's own professional capacity. Could I have the next slide, please? Uh, ever since this COVID crisis uh, broke out, we've been trying to understand in more detail uh, what is the preparedness of use for use of ICT in the region. And we've, been, we've recently uh, conducted the second round of a small survey. So I thought it would be important for me to share some of these uh, statistics that are emerging because this really gives us a clue into how we address the equity question which is very central in um, what this COVID-19 crisis is going to really uh, precipitate in the region. We find that many teachers have smartphones but only about 45 percent of teachers and 72 percent of teacher educators have laptops or computers and this is important because a mobile tends to be a consumption device while a laptop will make teachers uh, more in the productive role and become, have more Sorry, agency. Sorry, one more minute. Sorry, Sorry, one more minute. Yeah. We also find that 30% of teachers say that they don't have very good access to uh, internet. So whether ICT and online education can effectively work in the region is a serious concern. Uh, can I go to the next slide, please? I thought it's important for me to share what is being tried in the region. So in India, actually many other forms of technology are being deployed. There is the Swayam Prabha TV channel, which the NCRT has already begun to relay. And Diksha is a very important technology platform, which is now beginning to offer resources. At TISS, we are thinking about how we can use technology to empower teachers locally and personally, uh, and strengthen teachers' ability to interact and communicate using 
uh, technology. We've also been working on how to curate OERs for active learning in Indian languages and offering more professional development for teachers. But there are important questions that we will have to think about and which we see in the policy circulars which are emerging from the central government. Uh, how can we adjust the school weekday for social distancing, split, uh, uh, split classroom so that only half the population of the uh, school is in the school at any given point of time? Leveraging radio and print medium is being talked about. Maybe it's time for us to really provide teachers with laptops and data plans so we can enhance their own access to uh, devices and the need, of course, to decentralize uh, responses. So that's what I wanted to share from the Indian context. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, for, for the very nice presentation, um, uh, not only about India, but also uh, from South Asia perspective. Uh, I realize that you have mentioned many of the key uh, concepts, such as uh, teachers' operational autonomy and the social accountability. Uh, we need to think of both, right? Uh, rather than only uh, talking about uh, accountability, uh, accountability or uh, operational autonomy. It's supporting each other, actually. And mm -hmm. uh, if there's a strong guideline, external guideline, teacher will be more uh, well prepared and then they have more uh, uh, operational autonomy. Of course, action research is, uh, is means to achieving a, a greater uh, operational autonomy. Uh, but also uh, you have seen uh, this uh, uh, relationship between teachers and the pupils. Uh, but also it's not, uh, when we are talking about pedagogy, the traditional way is only to link teachers with students, this relationship. But now there's much more stakeholders that are evolved in the teaching and the learning process. Uh, we need to engage community, parents, and also more, many other stakeholders. So it's no longer teaching and learning are only between teachers and the students, right? So the pedagogy is much more expanded uh, conceptu uh, conceptions. Mm -hmm. And of course, we have seen so many infrastructure gap, capacity gap, and even uh, uh, coverage gap. And we are happy to see that in India, you are quite flexible in using high tech, low tech and also no tech uh, uh, solutions uh, to flexible learning, which is very, very uh, uh, flexible uh, in itself. Thank you very much again for, for your very inspiring uh, presentation. Now let's move to our next speaker. Um, uh, uh, from Mardif, uh, uh, His Excellency uh, Dr. Abdullah Rashid, uh, Honorable Minister of State for Education and the Head of National Institute of Education. Now, Honorable Minister, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Libby. Uh, I take this opportunity to thank UNESCO International uh, Teachers Task Force and uh, Bangkok in cl collaboration to organize this important uh, conference. I feel this is very important. Let me share uh, the Maldivian experience uh, uh, with you all. Now, ensuring ad adequate training for all teachers of effective online learning. Actually, in Maldives, uh, mm -hmm. since a few years back, we are using Google Classroom as the main online platform uh, to provide online education uh, to students. This uh, COVID pandemic forced us everyone to use our online platform more because more of this was, uh, especially the capital Malay. So we have to use our online platform. Therefore, teachers need training. Then uh, from Ministry of Education, we have decided to certify uh, our 7,000 teachers for, for Google education. Uh, we have divided this into three phases. In phase one, we have selected 100 teachers who are already competent uh, in ICT. We want, we want to certify them. And with the help of them, we want to train another 2,000 teachers. So first phase is done and uh, out of 100, many are already certified. And second phase is now going on. Uh, in, in the second phase, 2000 would be uh, certified. Once this phase is over, then we will focus uh, all the teachers, then all the teachers will be uh, certified. Uh, they will get Google certification. Uh, 
So this is the uh, online training mainly we have focused. However, uh, we need to provide uh, more pedagogical training. Uh, we hope we will get uh, assistance from UNESCO or UNESCO International uh, Teacher Task Force to provide education, uh, online education for the uh, teachers. And next, how we overcome challenges. Actually, uh, there are some households which don't have internet access. We did a survey to see who has the internet and who don't have internet. Those who don't have internet, uh, by discussing with our service providers, we, we have provided free 5GB data uh, to all the uh, students. And for the teachers, we have provided 10GB free data. Of course, this is not enough, but this is, uh, we, we were able to do uh, this much. And as some of my colleagues have mentioned that we are also using TV classes. Uh, before the lockdown, it was uh, 15th uh, April, uh, we were conducting uh, TV classes, we called teleclasses. Then due to the lockdown, we discontinued. And again, uh, day before yesterday, we have started teleclasses. Teachers are recording uh, lessons by using their own mobile phone while staying at home. Then they transfer the video to us. Uh, it is very challenging due to the speed of uh, internet. Somehow we are able to manage uh, to uh, start teleclasses from LKG to grade 12. Uh, it is going on. Meanwhile, uh, we, we, we are teaching students through Google Class, uh, but grade one, two, three, and LKG, UKG, we are not uh, teaching. For them, the main mode is uh, TV classes, but rest of the grade, it is both TV and uh, Google Classrooms. Uh, then uh, students with a special needs, we have made special uh, arrangement. Uh, parents can call the teachers at any time and teachers call the parents and give guidance. Uh, also, we have vulnerable students and uh, who are at risk. These students are monitored uh, very well. There is a special team very often uh, to see their well-being and uh, if any help is required, that is also uh, provided. Then, uh, Opportunities and challenges for reopening the schools. Uh, opportunities include includes government uh, education is government's highest uh, priority. But although its highest priority, as you all know, Maldives economic is uh, largely depends on tourism. Uh, due to COVID situation, all our resorts are closed, so we, we our income has gone down a lot. Then uh, we get assistance from uh, UNICEF and also uh, GPE, Global Partnership in Education. Our challenge includes, uh, there should be wash facilities in all the schools before we reopen, uh, which was not fully established. Now we are trying to see the possibility of to do this. Then students should be kept with physical distancing. As a result, uh, some of the schools, we already have uh, uh, multi-session schools. Some, some schools comes in the morning, and the rest of the schools come uh, afternoon. Again, uh, in order to minimize number of students in, a, in one class, we have further divided the students. Uh, therefore, we, need, we may have multiple sessions per day or we have to make alternative day students come to uh, school. So uh, these are very uh, challenging things. And also we have to ensure that uh, we have facilities and arrangements for uh, disinfection. So these, these are the uh, challenge. The main challenge are the internet speed. Internet speed is very low and internet access is low. So to, to conclude, I want to say uh, we need support from our, uh, our friendly countries and international organizations and donors. Thank you so much. Uh, and have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency, uh, for your very comprehensive uh, presentation about the responses of Maldives uh, to the uh, COVID-19 crisis. Uh, as you know, I'm happy to see that you are using Google Classroom, uh, which is quite uh, uh, obvious and uh, you do not need to have many, many uh, options uh, and uh, you are uh, uh, pushing for the certified uh, uh, 
teacher, you know, to, 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 to be able to use this uh, Google uh, Classroom, which is uh, uh, really uh, very much you know, relevant to your country. Uh, but, but of course, I also noticed that you are also paying attention to the uh, students with special needs and also uh, vulnerable students, which is very important, uh, but also the needs of social, social distancing. And uh, I think this, see, it must have some impact on the class size uh, in the short term. Uh, because we have to reduce class size uh, and which has uh, financial implications also and um, of course you are using tv as a, as a solution which is also very relevant to your country uh, for your information unesco bangkok is working with maldives uh, on the ict master plan and we are hoping that we can continue uh, this uh, uh, collaboration uh, in the future uh, okay, thank you very much once again. And now uh, we've done with all uh, these uh, full presentations, which are uh, quite, uh, you know, we have a lot of uh, uh, things in common, uh, but also uh, the, uh, the priority can be different from, from country to country. Uh, before we move to Q&A session, uh, we have one more session, uh, invited uh, uh, um, Spi from, uh, from the World Bank. May I uh, give the floor? to Dr. Tara uh, Bitia, uh, Senior Economist, uh, Head of uh, Teacher uh, Semantic Group from the World Bank, uh, to give a presentation to share the experiences of the World Bank in this region uh, with regard to, to addressing teachers and the teacher-related issues uh, in, the, uh, in the background of the COVID-19 uh, crisis. The floor is yours, thank you. Thanks, Li Ping, and thank you, colleagues, for really insightful presentations. What I'm going to do in my five minutes is I'm going to talk to you about the teacher's note that the World Bank has put out to support teacher effectiveness during COVID-19, and I'll try and give a few examples of what we're doing in the region and across the world. So um, one of the things that we know now is that over 180 school systems shut down because of the pandemic. Um, now some are opening up and frankly, you know, parents like us feel relatively comfortable knowing that our kids will be all right. You know, their schools and teachers have been working around the clock. At least the school that my son goes to, they've been using technology so effectively, I've been quite amazed and they do it with every kid. And my first grader son wakes up every morning excited to see what lessons his teachers have planned for him. But we know that that's not the reality of most school systems. And as teachers begin to come back to school, there's going to be a lot of stress that teachers face. And they're stressed for three reasons. One is just concern for their own health, well-being, that of loved ones. The second is the stress pertaining to the fact that many of their students would have fallen behind. And now the focus will be on teachers bringing these students back to speed without getting adequate professional development support. And the third is that many of our teachers just don't know how to cope in these new circumstances. They haven't received the technology or the skills to use technology effectively. Um, so let me lay out what the World Bank has been suggesting are three principles which must guide our support. And I should say that these principles have been influenced by the Teacher Talks Force Call for Action, which went out in March. So maybe the next slide. So the three principles are first, to support teacher resilience, to ensure teacher effectiveness. And this speaks to the point of stress. The second is to support teachers instructionally to ensure teacher effectiveness. And the third principle is to support teachers technologically to ensure teacher effectiveness. The way the World Bank has conceptualized the entire recovery is in three phases. The first phase, is the coping phase. So that's the phase when schools are shut. Then is the phase of managing continuity, which is when schools begin to open. And the third is the phase which can be used as an opportunity to improve and accelerate reforms within the system. So I'll go very quickly over each of the principles, but briefly there are three main principles. So resilience, instruction, and technology. So next slide. So when we talk about supporting teacher resilience, it's really important that we work with our client governments to protect teacher jobs and salaries so that there is a motivated workforce in place when teachers and students return to school. 
Here, what I want to emphasize is really one part, which in the managing and continuity phase focuses on limiting the kind of burnout that teachers are likely to face and what can we do to help them. So as examples, we have peer, structured peer support groups in one of our projects in the DRC, which is trying to help teachers communicate with each other, build more team culture and team spirit, and talk to each other about their stresses and strains. A second interesting initiative is in Mexico. It's um, being, uh, it's along with the Healthy Minds work being pioneered in the University of Wisconsin, which helps teachers deal with daily life stresses using the latest findings in neuroscience. These are things that we hope we can build more into our work with governments. And of course, then as things begin to stabilize, to have more specialized counseling units for teachers. So the next slide, which is principle two, and this is to support teachers instructionally to ensure teacher effectiveness. A few of the things that I wanna point out here, other than the importance of ensuring psychosocial well-being, is to help teachers equip, you know, equip them to assess where students are when students return. Teachers are gonna to have to deal with a range of learning shortfalls and how can they figure out where different students are and then tailor support to students who are most likely to drop out. So strategies for that. And then, you know, as an opportunity to begin to think of professional development a little differently so that it's much more flexible, more suited to individual teacher needs. It's shorter, it's blended, it uses both ki every kind of media. Um, and also having just-in-time support for teachers. So specifically here, like help desks and things, teachers receive training often just once a year, and after that, they're left on their own. But we could really invest in systems where they can reach out, whether it's through a WhatsApp group or Facebook groups, to experts who can help them just before they are about to teach a particular kind of lesson or lesson plan. Um, the next slide. Sorry Principle to interrupt, three. one more minute, one yes. more minute, thank you. Yes, and that is to support teachers technologically to ensure teacher effectiveness. And here what I wanna emphasize is the importance of providing teachers access to broadcast and digital communication channels. I was, it was great to hear from our colleagues in Maldives how this is being done. And similarly, we have our uh, colleagues in Kyrgyz Republic, for instance, who've given SIM cards to teachers. So giving them access to broadcast, but along with that, also helping them build skills. I'm going to actually conclude here because I know that we're running out of time and I'm eager for the discussion section. But this note is available, which outlines these three principles, which much more detailed examples. Thank you. You may be on mute sleeping, we can't hear you. Thank you, Tara, for, for your very uh, inspiring uh, presentation, especially the, the three principles, which I really agree, uh, which is covering uh, not only the pay and the condition and the motivation of the teaching profession, but also professional development. As you know that traditionally, they are only related to pedagogy type of things, but uh, with the increasing use of ICT, we can, use, we can see the integration of ICT with pedagogy. Uh, so uh, the teacher's professional development is very important. Uh, you are covering both uh, sides of the story. Uh, we used to say that uh, pay and condition are very much covered by international labor organization for the protection of the, uh, of the profession, you know, people, but also uh, professionalization is more covered by UNESCO. Uh, but of course, I'm happy that uh, World Bank is taking this approach very comprehensive. Uh, I, I would like to thank you again for, for showing us uh, this uh, kind of uh, framework. Okay, uh, now we have done all uh, for, uh, uh, another additional uh, invited uh, uh, speech. Now let's move to questions and answers. I, I know that there's a lot of uh, questions that have been raised through chat room. And uh, I would uh, like my colleague Leila to, to show us uh, how many questions have been received and what kind of uh, questions you would like to put 
on table for, for panelists to, to, to answer. Thank you, Leila. Thank you, Living, and um, thank you, everyone, and welcome. And thank you so much for, well, there's been a lot of interesting and engaging questions as well. And um, I'm, I hope we can try and cover all of them. We may not be able to, but I'd like to thank everyone for your really interesting engagement. And yes, the panelists are most welcome to put their videos on now if they'd like to. Um, maybe I'll start with three questions and we'll see how we go if we have time for more. Yes. I think mm -hmm. the questions, there was a few questions which were looking at um, the digital divide. How are countries trying to ensure that for both students and teachers, um, there is an, a sufficient connectivity to be able to ensure um, distance learning? So that was the first question. Uh, the second one was about um, how are teachers being supported to address um, educational uh, inequities um, which have been ex exacerbated by the pandemic? So there was a question about um, supporting teachers to deal with um, equity in, um, as schools return. Um, and another one was um, there was a few people were interested in questions about um, how are teachers being prepared to engage with parents and the communities, um, because obviously teachers are on the front line with dealing with the communities. So um, if any countries have some examples of um, how teachers are being supported to engage with parents, because obviously the role of parents is very important here. I'll stop with those three and we'll see if we have time for more others. Thank, thank you. you. Um, thank you, Leila, for, for these three questions. Actually, uh, according yeah, to my I, understanding, the first two is quite uh, related with each other, digital divide, and how teacher can be supported yeah. to address the uh, inequality uh, issue. Uh, yes, let's move to uh, Professor Ren, if you can, you would like to uh, answer these questions. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Professor Ren, the floor is yours. Yes, yes. Uh, poverty uh, stricken area have no internet or show a slow internet speed, etc. Relevant courses and resources are broadcast on TV. Actually, you know, almost every family in China have at least one TV set. And almost every family, no matter how poor or rich, have one mobile set. So when you cannot use mobile set, you can use a TV set. So we also have the learning and teaching program on, on TV set to solve the problem of student study. Here I show you the picture that's quite near the Wuhan city. There's a family, this is the mama and uh, her daughter. Uh, the daughter is under the platform uh, of, the, of their store. The store sold very delicious food. And uh, the daughter is used a uh, used computer to learn the online courses and also mama's tele mama's mobile phone you can see the mama's mobile phone and the and the uh, use the computer there are two equipment there the mama is is helping the the daughter to learn the courses and uh, this is quite familiar now in china many families that uh, they are not very rich they are just uh, workers but they can use this and also they get the help from the, the school teachers and also the the, the community, you know, workers to help them. So this is just a case. Here comes an example. Uh, in response to the students in remote mountainous area of a province moving widely on the mountain looking for internet signals, China Telecom uh, act actively assumed the responsibility of, con uh, of central uh, enterprises, opens broadband for that area, donates mobile phones, for left behind students, gives free mobile data resources to teachers and students, and opens the so called TNE Cloud Classroom to many places across the country free of charge, so that students in remote areas can use suspending in classroom, in cla suspending in classroom classes without stopping teaching or no, no learning uh, re re realities uh, through live. Uh, broadcasting, rebroadcasting, replay, and on-demand display. And uh, about the platform, you know, in China we have the Tencent platform, uh, Ali, Huawei, and also 
the Zoom, like Zoom. Many, many schools also choose this Zoom, this, this system we are using now. So all this is what, what we are doing. And also we are now uh, making a, a, a action plan that for the post epidemic, you know, uh, syndrome to help the teachers, the parents, and also the students to recover back to the uh, normal life. But we still think that there are some methods that we can keep. That means we can use this online uh, method to help us have a better, you know, teacher and learning environment. So I'm starting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ren, for, for this very detailed explanation of what China is doing uh, to try to expand the coverage of, uh, of uh, you know, uh, this uh, online internet services uh, to, the, to the remote areas. I think it's subsidized by the government. Uh, it's uh, many of the instruction de development is quite ahead of their economic development, actually. So it's very much understandable and uh, we can see um, uh, this kind of infrastructure coverage will be uh, will be promoted uh, when, uh, to to try to uh, remove the uh, digital gap. But I would also like to see, uh, as a country, uh, as also a big country, uh, India. I don't know if uh, Professor Padma can could you would would you like to share with us any any good uh, examples of uh, of uh, addressing the inequality uh, issues uh, when it comes to so um, who, uh, in a way the country has been preparing to integrate a lot more technology into instruction so that is something which is going for us it's not that we anticipated the pandemic but already this platform called diksha is has been developed it's a very stable platform and it has a very large number of resources that teachers can access. And so this is a, a very positive thing that we have with us, which we can now uh, take advantage of. School textbooks have also, we have incorporated QR codes so that there's direct access to these resources through QR codes. But the key problem mm. that will have to be overcome is really access to internet and devices in the lowest socioeconomic groups. And that I think is going to be overcome only with investment of, for infrastructure for these groups. Uh, and I think that's something that we need to be thinking about. But as you pointed out, multi-technology approaches are very important in our country. Uh, and we also need to have solutions that are suitable for under-resourced contexts. We cannot assume that there yep. will be stable online connectivity. So we will have to have asynchronous modes of working. And I think a lot more project-based learning, authentic learning opportunities, I think we should really leverage on those things going forward uh, to overcome this crisis at this stage. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Professor. I, I think maybe one other option can be uh, to promote a public-private partnership uh, to bring in more resources from, to work together with the private sector will be another yes, yes. solution. In fact, all the technology work that has happened in the country, a very large extent has been through public-private partnerships. So I think, um, mm. yeah, it, it will certainly involve that, building on that. But the let me also move to infrastructure uh, uh, yeah. is a non-negotiable, I think. Access yes, to yes, devices. that's a responsibility yeah. of the government, but of course yes. there's a room for, for us to engage private sector. Of course, yeah. Let me move to Cambodia. If uh, you have any any uh, uh, ideas about uh, the questions, the th uh, three questions, but especially uh, if you would like to say something about the third question about uh, uh, engagement with parents and the uh, uh, communities, uh, because it's very important. In the in traditionally, you know, uh, we are only seeing. Uh, uh, a teacher pupil relationship uh, but uh, i think quality education needs us to engage communities and even the parents so i don't know if uh, in cambodia you have any uh, good examples of uh, teachers to engage parents and the communities in, in, in you know promoting quality education thank, thank you living uh, we we do um um, we, uh, I, I think we heard a lot from parents that they, they have to stay home, stay in, and they have more work to do at home than the work that they have to do at home. Um, it, at school, uh, we recorded a lot of uh, videos by grade, by subject, and we made available at school in the classroom. And for those who cannot have, who cannot afford uh, uh, TV, or mobile phone or, or computer, they can come to school. 
uh, a level of control in terms of, of social distancing. So they can come in uh, to the classroom and the teachers and parents, they can bring their children to school and control their students, uh, control their children not, not to go away, you know, so they can bring their children to school and to access to the video at school and the computer at school because if the ministry supply, you know, all these kind of video clips through the Telegram, through the Facebook, through uh, Google Classroom online and report it and also materials. So, so to be inclusive and uh, those who can, who can learn from home by using the, the device, they can do at home. But for those who cannot afford all those devices, they can come to school with support from parents and support from teachers with a control, uh, social distancing, you know, spacing in how they sit and work. So the, the ministry uh, signed an MOU with the Ministry of, of Information to, to make many things available uh, uh, and supply to, to, to and, and we also issue guidelines for parents on how to support uh, home learning and, and, and engagement to school in order to get material from teachers and, and to link with teachers. So this is what we have done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your reflections on this uh, very important issue of uh, parental and uh, community engagement. Uh, because it's it's important that uh, it should be part of uh, teachers' competencies to have the ability to engage uh, parents and the communities in the right way. Uh, dear, uh, uh, Your Excellency, the Minister uh, Abdullah, uh, could you share with us your, your ideas about these three uh, questions, especially uh, the parental, uh, you know, and also community engagement? Uh, what's the right way? Because um, Homeschooling in the past is, is, uh, was replaced by schooling, uh, right, uh, at the school, right? But now it's quite, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, challenging uh, because uh, homeschooling is more or less returning uh, to, to, to us, uh, actually. And uh, uh, the role of parents are, are very important. And uh, if you can share with us some of your, your ideas on this. Uh. Uh, ho ho you mean ho homeschooling and engaging the students while uh, they are staying at home? Yes, now. No, I mean, also. I mean, I mean, I mean, engagement with parents as part of the routine work of the schools and even the teachers, because we have only have a usual contacts with the parents, which is not enough. Usually, every school have a parents' day uh, every semester which is just for courtesy. Many of them are just for courtesy, right? So if we can engage uh, parents in a meaningful way, and if we can engage the community in a very meaningful way, then it will be contributing to, to the relevance of the education and effectiveness of the education. I think it's very important that uh, uh, teachers should work together with parents and the local communities. This is their responsibility, right? Thank you. Yes. Uh, actually, from Ministry of Education, uh, we have informed, we, quite often we have a, a virtual meeting with our principals, with all the, all the principals, and we advise the principals uh, through the teachers at least uh, twice a week should contact with the uh, students and to see how they are uh, doing and uh, discuss with the uh, parents. And some schools, uh, actually have parents meet also virtually. They do have virtual uh, parents meeting. Uh, we have a high em emphasis on uh, keeping the connectivity with the uh, parents, students, and uh, schools. And from our non-formal education uh, department, they are working on providing uh, awareness and what are the things that parents can do while uh, kids stay at home and uh, including myself and my colleagues we also go to the tv and uh, these days we, we give skype interview and giving information to the parents how they can engage students while they are uh, staying at home because our uh, the vision of our curriculum is every child is prepared for life so many things can be done when students stay at home uh, involving uh, involving students what parents uh, do giving them opportunity involving cooking and household chores and uh, many things. So 
we are trying our best to ensure that students engage uh, meaningful activities with the parents apart from the uh, learning activities. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I, I think now we are promoting blended learning, which is not only a, a combination of online and the offline learning, it's also a combination of informal, non-formal and the formal learning, right? We should plan our, uh, our sessions, uh, even, uh, you know, uh, make uh, community-based learning mandatory uh, um, uh, for, for, for students, and t you know, to, to finish a program, right? So uh, experimental learning, community-based learning, and, uh, and everywhere should be a place to learn, right? So this is what uh, we think um, it's very important for teachers to have this kind of capacity. Okay, Leila, I don't know how long can we go or can we have another round of, uh, uh, of uh, questions or we just go to the wrap up session? Um, thank you. I think it might be difficult to have a round, but I know there's also a question directed at the World Bank, um, which has also uh, been reflected in quite a lot of other questions, um, which is looking at um, how are we equipping teachers to assess students? Um, so maybe if um, the representative of the World Bank and if any other people might quickly want to respond to that before we... Yes, yes, Tara, 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 uh, just uh, share with us some of your ideas about online assessment. This is uh, a question about online assessment. Actually, it's not easy to assess uh, people's performance. <laughs> Uh, but it of isn't. course, uh, we, yes, I think a lot of tips online, uh, you can see a lot of tips, uh, how to do mm -hmm. this, more communication, all this and that. But if you can share with us uh, your, your, your ideas on online assessment. So, um, let me actually, I don't have many ideas on online assessment in particular. I think what um, I was alluding to was preparing teachers to assess children once they return to school. So it would not be online, it would be very much um, in classrooms. And this was also in keeping in view the situation in most of our countries where we have many students who wouldn't have access to online mechanisms for being mm. assessed. Mm. Um, and the kind of, what we really, I think, wanna do is first focus on foundational skills. Um, mm. Are children still able to read or not? And what's going on there? Are they able to do their basic math? And to be able to do that, I think what teachers will need is a set of question banks, very simple question banks and ideas for question ready-made assessments and how these core content and skills can be evaluated and what stage they are, you know, whether they've been mastered or not and where they fall behind on that. They'll also need support actually on other things such as just recording that information. Teachers don't always necessarily have the time to go and sit and record everything. They're evaluating children, but they haven't put it together systematically. And they will have to be then trained on figuring out how to use that information, how to identify which students are likely to drop out, and then to mm -hmm. work more closely with that, those kinds of students, possibly to have some kind of ability grouping in the classroom where you group students into different categories. And there are many different models for doing this. And uh, we would have to find ways of supporting teachers and training them. Some training can happen while schools are closed. And I'm gonna talk about just very low resource environments. Mm -hmm. Those trainings would have to use broadcast media such as radio or TV, and they would have to be interactive. So teachers would have to be able to call in and be able to speak to someone. And that would be your basic background that teachers you know, have some basic understanding of how to do this. And then once face-to-face -face training is possible, then teachers will need a little more support. So that, that, that is what we had in mind. I think online assessment is super important as well, but we're still figuring that out. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much for your for your reflections on this issue, which is really important. Actually, uh, as UNESCO, we are also uh, uh, requested to 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 work on on this area, uh, online assessment. I don't know if other panelists, if you have any idea uh, on the online assessment assessment before we move to the final wrap up session. Mm -hmm. Actually, uh, uh, it is an area uh, teachers need support a lot because uh, this much intensive level, this is the first time that uh, we are using online platform. 
So teachers were trained for the physical uh, assessment on physical classrooms uh, through online. It is really challenging. I think that is an area that International Task Force or UNESCO can help uh, teachers. This is a, a, a very important area. Uh, thank you for raising this issue. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, that's all from uh, for the question and answer session. Uh, if we uh, agree, uh, Leila uh, and. Uh, I would like to move to our next session. Uh, I'm very pleased uh, to have the participation of our very, uh, my friend and, and, and uh, um, Dr. Esso Anias uh, Valenzuela uh, from CIMEO. Uh, she, she is the director of the CIMEO Secretariat uh, to uh, give a wrap up uh, remarks. Uh, uh, now, Esso, the, the, the floor is yours. Good afternoon to all our distinguished panelists and webinar participants from all over the region. We have come to the end of our session on the Teacher Task Force virtual regional meeting, and this is the first time for Asia and the Pacific. Let me thank Dr. Borhin, Laila, and Aditi of the Teacher Task Force Secretariat and our distinguished speakers. You have shared a lot of your expertise and your knowledge and how you cope up with the situation. Indeed, COVID-19 has affected our teachers, our region, our economists around the globe. And C-19, as we cut it short, has indeed gave us not just health crisis, but education crisis as well. Most of us are on the reset mode and we are shaping our new world together. We are seeing a sense of psychosocial, moral, social implications to the world as we face pandemic together. You know, technology now affects our teachers big time. And I think this was predicted in, in 2016 or a few years ago. And we are all working together to fight the virus and we help each other in three ways. So some of you are doing research, action research, knowledge sharing, and also, most of you are doing continuity of learning, delivering education online, home-based, flexible, or remote. We are also preparing our teachers in the new school ecosystem. Teachers, learners, and leaders have to adopt and embrace the emerging technologies as is uh, used in the remote learning. And I think the re research and development on COVID-19 from surveys to doing your emergency plans of action, setting up infrastructure, as well as engaging parents on home-based learning, these are very important. The teacher task force call for action is very timely. The panel shared what they have done from training of teachers or connecting with decision makers and uh, ministers here, education leaders, and national survey on response to COVID. In CIMEO, we have done a lot of regional consultations since uh, March of this year to, to you know, let us know the academic mobility to get back our students from overseas and to help prepare teachers in the crisis. We did regional surveys for policymakers, uh, teachers, higher education institutions, including basic education. And we learned from the teacher task force today that there are seven action points from Dr. Borhim, uh, planning and supporting teachers in safety and health, psychosocial well-being of teachers, teacher preparation and learning, teacher deployment and in this time, it's quite difficult and uh, challenging. Financial to support to them as they engage the learners in a new way, like uh, having all these videos, like what Cambodia said, monitoring and evaluation and assessment during COVID, social dialogue and communication. The regional roadmap is here and the ASPAC teams using uh, Zoom meeting in different regions would be beneficial. So what are the key takeaways? So from listening to the speakers, I learned that the really teachers are the backbones of our education system they are really prized and valued especially at this time they can be in the classroom they can be in zoom like what we're doing and they can be anywhere and teachers are the keys to reaching the learning goals 
So our 63 billion teachers need to be equipped on how to teach differently at this time, not face to face. They are, there is a profound shift in teaching from face to face to remote and virtual teaching. And this is a new phenomenon or maybe leading to having a new normal. But the call to action and policy guidance from teacher task force is very useful, as well as the World Bank three key principles. So you have, uh, you know, resilience, you have technology and instruction. These three should really go together. So our uh, teacher task force have done a lot in reaching out to as many decision makers as possible, like today. And we need really to capacitate teachers in doing distance, flexible learning, and online. So different responses for different situations. You cannot have one size fits all. So what is done in China with all the different methodologies and five cycles or five phases may, may be different from another you know, country as in, as in Maldives or such as in Cambodia. But there is one thing that is common, that teachers are now increasingly using digital technology. And there is a sort of new cultural renaissance coming in, new society that is emerging. And so our humanity, we people, are coping differently. So I think uh, in a few more months, there will be new values emerging, new teaching strategies, and we will be identifying new normal soon. The family's role in education is increasingly becoming bigger, as you know, the shadow teachers are no longer available. They can go out of their uh, you know, uh, houses, but the parents now play a role in coaching or teaching students while on lockdown. And this has been happening now, while well, before there are tutors or shadow teachers playing a big role. And uh, now I think we are seeing a new destiny. So teachers are expected to, you know, attain the goals that are somehow unattainable at this situation. But I think there are many stories how teachers cope and how teachers contributed at the best possible situation or best possible intervention at this time. We're very lucky that, uh, you know, we learned from different perspective from India, you know, the community of practice is important and that we should continue to share all our knowledge in the platform. And uh, of course, from, from the World Bank, we should continue to, uh, you know, enhance resiliency of teachers in this situation and be more flexible and to be more caring at this time. So uh, in a study of uh, higher education institutions all over the world, presidents of universities prioritize social, mental, and, and uh, health and well-being of students and teachers that we should also consider as we prepare for a post-COVID situation and response. So I thank uh, Dr. Giving for, for somehow wrapping up every presentation and I was able to get a lot of insights from that and also teacher task force for always uh, you know leading us through the action plans and the country best practices are really important because many countries of the world are in lockdown and they're groping for some experiences sharing and knowledge sharing from policymakers such as you. So uh, thank you so much uh, teacher task force and we we wish that the other regional meetings would be equally successful as the Asia and the Pacific. Thank you Leila and uh, Aditi. Have a good day. Thank you, thank you uh, Ethel. Uh, thank you Ethel for this very nice uh, um, concluding remarks uh, which captured uh, all the key points uh, presented today. And I would say that uh, we cannot be back to, to the old normal and the new normal will require us to think ahead of the changing uh, working environment for the teachers and the, and the new uh, competency requirements for the teachers and how we can prepare uh, teachers uh, for the new uh, normal. Uh, and the traditionally the conventional way of teaching and learning is no longer uh, sustainable as I can see even we return to normal life. Um, uh, blended type of learning can be the 
uh, can be mainstreamed actually. And you can see flexible learning pathway. Uh, normally in the past, we focusing on post school education by developing uh, qualifications framework for post school education. But actually at the school level, uh, school curriculum standards should really think of uh, um, uh, how to uh, make more use of online or technology in the delivery of, of the uh, programs. So this is all kinds of new normal and it's affecting uh, a lot of the teacher uh, education institution also. Uh, homeschooling is unfortunately uh, becoming a reality. Uh, of course, this is quite different from the previous uh, homeschooling. Uh, as you can see now, uh, traditionally we said schooling is uh, education is compulsory, but not necessarily schooling. We can use flexible learning uh, 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 you know, modalities, uh, which would include you know, uh, uh, community-based learning, home-based learning, and also uh, other uh, modalities. So this is very challenging, and I think um, we would continue uh, to reflect on, on the future uh, uh, way of uh, promoting the professionalism of the teaching profession. And uh, I would also like to take this opportunity to thank the uh, International Teacher Task Force uh, with secretariat in headquarters in Paris, headed by Boreen Chaklan and also uh, my colleague Leila uh, for organizing this very useful uh, webinar, which uh, will bring us uh, all together, uh, which uh, with so rich, uh, you know, uh, ideas and, uh, and the solutions. Uh, and thanks again uh, to all the panelists uh, from, from uh, China, from India, from uh, Maldiv and from uh, um, uh, the, the countries um, uh, and uh, and uh, Cambodia, and uh, lastly, may I propose everybody to show up, turn on your video, then we can have a screenshot for a group photo before we 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 end our meet, meeting. Please turn on uh, your video, everybody. Oh yes, so I saw you, uh, Professor. Can you turn on all your video to show up? Then I can do a screenshot. I think unfortunately the last- Yes, yes, everybody, not... everybody. Professor Ren, Professor Ren, and also Professor Padma and Professor uh, uh, yes. Dr. My video is on. Yes, I can see Padma. On, unfortunately, right? my colleague Eddie, so she cannot turn show up? On. Can we show up? <laughs> oh, yeah, you can um, all do your- Okay, okay, thank you very much uh, for, for your participation and the contribution. See you next time and hope we can have you uh, participate in our next regional meeting uh, organized by Teacher Task Force very soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy it. Learned a lot. Thank you very much. Okay, Leila. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. It was really wonderful. Thank you so much. We'll follow up by email. Thank you, Libing. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Again. Thank you, Dr. Abdallah. Nice to see you again. Thank you. Bye, Lila. Bye bye. Thank you, Ethel. Thank you bye. so much. Bye. Thank you. Really nice wrap up. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Abdallah. Thank you. Enjoy your lunch. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you are here. Yeah, exactly. Bye. Exactly. Bye. Thank you. Okay. Okay.